coach Chris Winslow, and I'm, I'm the director of uh, both the Ohio Sea Grant College Program, a NOAA-funded entity, and also Ohio State University's Stone Lab. Um, and, and welcome. I, I definitely want to say that I'm excited for us to have this opportunity to talk about a wetland support effort that's funded by um, our governor's H2 Ohio program. I guess I'll just start off by saying collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Uh, you'll see that listed throughout this presentation today. This would not be possible without a bunch of our academic institutions, but also amazing support by the DNR and, and the staff in the DNR. Um, Kent State University is taking the lead research role here, but also uh, the, the academics and the agencies being able to engage with the folks in the field that are actually deploying these, these wetlands. So that's fantastic. Excited to see the turnout. We're around 180 folks, but not only that um, great turnout, the diversity of folks on the call, the interest that's out there. I see environmental planners, researchers, reporters, educators, students. We've got some media folks on the line. We've got elected officials, state agency, federal agency representation, private consultants. So there is a, a, a true and genuine interest in, in what's going on um, under this wetland um, monitoring program. I also want to thank uh, Director Mertz. I know she's on today. Um, I just wanted to recognize her presence. She, uh, she wanted to make sure we had enough time to discuss what we're going to discuss here. So she didn't want to say any, any words, but she um, says hello. And, and um, so I thank her for being on. Just to set the stage for us, you're not going to see a lot of results today. Um, so this is really, uh, it took a heavy lift to get to where we're at now, but we're going to just kind of show you where we're at. There was a lot of planning to develop the, uh, the monitoring plan, equipment's being purchased, crews are going in the field. So we're very much in the thick of things right now. So this is kind of going to be a, a where we're at kind of presentation. Um, in the chat, you will see a link to a two-pager. That'll be a summary of what we're doing and also the website for LEARN. It is a placeholder right now. We are constructing that wetland because of tweaks that we need to do associated with the wetland work. So that'll be available in the fall. And the last thing I'll say before we roll out, folks that registered did have the opportunity to suggest questions for this. Um, and there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. So what I will do, I will step away until the end of the program where I will moderate questions. I'll tell you that we got more questions submitted than we have time to answer and we'll probably get some in real time. So apologize if we don't get to your question, but, but it's, our, it's our intent to, to field as many of those as we can. And so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm also just as excited to share uh, the program that we've built uh, to monitor wetlands in a relatively short period of time. Um, but to start us off, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Janice Kearns from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to outline uh, the motivation for establishing the monitoring program in the first place. So take it away, Janice. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Lauren and Chris. Um, and yeah, so since uh, there is such a wide audience that we have here, I know uh, probably a significant portion are already familiar with the H2 Ohio initiative. I just want to go through very quickly a brief background um, about H2 Ohio uh, and then what the ODNR approach is to H2, to H2 Ohio, what we've accomplished so far from the restoration standpoint, and then I'll hand over the reins back to Lauren. Uh, and she'll give you a, a great lengthy description about the wetland monitoring program that is associated with this work. So in 2019, Governor Mike DeWine uh, introduced H2 Ohio, a water quality initiative uh, to invest in targeted long-term uh, solutions to ensure clean and safe water in Lake Erie and throughout Ohio. The, there are three strategies that are key to this program, including land-based protection, water-based restoration, and science-based monitoring and research. Next slide. Since then, the state of Ohio agencies tasked with implementing H2 Ohio have led a comprehensive data-driven effort to address Ohio's water challenges through collaboration among the Department of Natural Resources, uh, the Ohio's Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Agriculture, and the Lake Erie Commission, as well as many other partners, as Chris has already mentioned, um, uh, throughout the state. Next slide. The overarching strategies that Ohio will use to limit, reduce, and prevent nutrients from getting into our watershed include a focus on agricultural land management, since that has been identified as a significant source of phosphorus, uh, one of the primary culprits of harmful algal blooms. 
Second, Ohio is working to restore wetlands to recover their function in removing nutrients from the waterways. And then third, Ohio will also work to address issues around community resources, including water and wastewater treatment infrastructure. Next slide. For the ODNR, focusing on natural infrastructure projects like these can be that can be designed to absorb excess nutrient runoff. Wetlands also offer additional environmental benefits by absorbing other pollutants, slowing down the movement of water, offering natural filtering processes, and preventing further movement of contaminated water, while also being cost effective and also uh, provide additional benefits to both wildlife and society. Next slide. Since the initial phase of this program started in uh, 2019 with 27 projects, it has been expanded and almost doubled in size to the current 59 projects, uh, wetland projects that are underway that benefit over 100,000 acres of associated watersheds and may benefit up to 90 different wetland species. It is also important to point out here that we are not doing this work alone. The design development and the implementation of these projects could not have happened without the 25 different conservation partners and ever including more and more groups as we develop these programs. Next slide. The priority of the selected wetlands projects so far are those that are located in watersheds that contribute to a high level of nutrient runoff are situated to filter the drainage from a large area of agricultural landscape, are sized to have a wetland pool area that is efficient relative to contributing watershed, and also offers intangible benefits such as ease to building execution and assistance and long-term support from project partners. As seen in this map, the ODNR initially, they maintain a strong focus on reducing nutrient loading, uh, both in the MAMI, water drainage area and the adjacent Western Lake Erie Basin watershed. And it has since expanded to the Central Lake Erie Basin in Northeast Ohio and is now working to expand into the Ohio River Basin. Next slide. However, within all of these projects are a wide variety of wetland types that uh, have specific and distinct hydrological properties that provide unique challenges. As seen here in this diagram, depending on the location to adjacent water sources, water can move through these different wetlands in different ways from a simple linear path as seen here on the left through the flow through wetland to a more unidirectional or bidirectional movement found in our coastal wetlands due to flow from upriver locations and also safe events that uh, occur within Lake Erie. And then we also have isolated wetlands uh, that may have some less obvious connections to direct waterways uh, and, are, and occur, the water filtration through these systems occur from surface level connections down through the groundwater uh, that lies below it. Next slide. So here are two examples of a flow through wetland. Wetlands include, these wetlands include the Porter Bridge, which is adjacent to the Maumee River, and Brooks Park project that flows into the Buckeye Lake in central Ohio. The focus of these restorations has included installing a series of wetlands along a small meandering tributary. These construction uh, projects slowed down the movement of water and increased the residency time within these wetlands prior to moving into their associated uh, lakes or rivers. Next slide. For coastal wetlands, the McGee Marsh Turtle Creek project along Lake Erie happens to be one of our more simpler projects and that it will involve uh, reconnecting this diked wetland to associated upstream uh, watershed and allowing for a final filtration point before directing the water downstream into Lake Erie. Next slide. For isolating uh, wetlands, a good example is a Fruth Wetland uh, Nature Preserve that was one of our first restorations that we completed. It's an 18 acre parcel that is in collaboration with Seneca Park Districts. This restoration uh, uh, involved creating, recreating wetland hydrology by working to break up agricultural drain, child drains, and ha while having less obvious direct connection to a tributary or watershed. Next slide. 
The last project I will run through for you is Red Horse Bend Preserve, which is a great example of a floodplain wetland that can be found just outside Fremont, Ohio, along the Sandusky River. Former agricultural land, this wetland has been restored to allow wetland pools to backfill into this area from uh, a downstream location during periodic flows uh, and storm events. Next slide. However, with all these projects, the ODNR and state scientists recognize that each type uh, will likely vary in capacity to reduce nutrient runoff and will require different sampling approaches uh, to determine overall cost effectiveness of wetlands for mitigating nutrient loads. In addition, as stewards of these sites, we'll also want to know what effective management strategies are moving forward um, as we develop and maintain these restoration sites in the future. Next slide. And because the Governor DeWine desires to make H2O Ohio initiative a comprehensive data-driven approach, the ODNR has made it a priority to determine and quantify the effectiveness and future role of implementing and planning wetland restoration products that have been designed to reduce nutrient runoff. To answer these questions and provide accountability, the ODNR has enlisted the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network to develop and implement H2O Ohio wetland monitoring programs. And with that, I will hand it to Lauren. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Janice. Um, that was a really great overview of the, the challenges and opportunities that the ODNR came to learn with um, that we've been able to make some progress on addressing that we're really excited to share with you today. Um, I'm Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello at Kent State University. I'm a member of LEARN. So LEARN, the Lake Erie Aquatic and Research Network is a consortium of mostly academic researchers throughout the state of Ohio and elsewhere that study Lake Erie and other aquatic ecosystems um, in the area. Uh, its main goal is to connect researchers both with each other and with agency and societal needs. So this opportunity was a really great opportunity for LEARN to make good on this wonderful resource that we have uh, among the academic researchers in the state of Ohio. So we were able to dive into this resource and assemble uh, basically a dream team of different people with different expertise who are able to come together and think about how to develop a monitoring program that would effectively create information necessary across all of these different kinds of wetlands and so many different kinds, so many different wetlands, right? So um, we drew, we're drawing expertise from faculty and researchers at six different universities throughout the state of Ohio. I unfortunately don't have time to introduce every single one, but we include hydrologists, plant ecologists, soil scientists, soil geophysicists, modelers, um, uh, people with long standing expertise in monitoring water quality and running monitoring programs, um, because this is a really multi pronged uh, project. So we started in uh, spring and summer of 2020, having a lot of zoom meetings looking at this map of potential projects. I think there were about 26 at the time and thinking about what we would need to do to answer those critical research questions that Janice and the ODNR posed to us. So before I get into that, I'll back up and provide a little bit of background that relates to my expertise as a wetland biogeochemist that comes to bear on this um, issue. So many people on this call have probably heard the phrase that wetlands are the kidneys of the landscape because of their natural ability to filter water and filter out pollutants and contaminants, much like the kidneys and our bodies do. So you can imagine a watershed like the watersheds leading into Lake Erie that has uh, excess nutrients, uh, one kind of contaminant, nitrogen and phosphorus coming off the watershed. Um, and one way we can conceptualize implementing wetlands for water quality removal is basically slapping all these kidneys up on the watershed to try and clean up this water. By and large, uh, this is true. Wetlands are can be really effective filterers and really effective at contaminant removal, but there are a couple of really important caveats that we want to consider. The first is that the ability of wetlands to remove pollutants varies. It varies from ecosystem to ecosystem. It varies 
uh, different parts within the same ecosystem, and even a single wetland over time, its ability to remove different forms of pollutant can change over time. In fact, at times, wetlands can actually be a nutrient source rather than a nutrient sink. So rather than removing nutrients from water that may be flowing through them and preventing them from getting downstream into vulnerable water bodies, um, it may actually uh, release nutrients that have been stored within that ecosystem. So the graph that you see on the right uh, of your slide here is some work that I did during my dissertation demonstrating that when a historically drained field in southwest Michigan was reflooded as part of a wetland restoration project, the soils released a considerable amount of phosphorus into the surface water. And then some of that phosphorus exited the wetland was exported to downstream tributaries. You'll notice that the high SRP concentrations, that phosphorus release was transient and temporary, but it's still something that we want to be aware of, especially when uh, our purpose specifically is preventing this kind of nutrient um, sourcing. And then finally, one really important complicating factor is that there's some inherent differences in nitrogen and phosphorus. Often we talk about wetlands removing nutrients all in one sentence, but it's important to remember that these two nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, that both contribute in really important ways to eutrophication and harmful algal blooms are chemically very different and biologically um, processed through ecosystems very differently. So I'm going to give everybody a nutrient biogeochemistry 101. Right after this, you could go and take some of the tests from my biogeochemistry class that I teach um, and pass with flying colors. So you can handle this, pay attention. So you can imagine a wetland, right? How does a wetland stop this nitrogen and phosphorus going into it, okay? One way is plants, right? Plants take up nitrogen and phosphorus and use it as building blocks to build leaves and build flowers and build stems, just like when you fertilize your garden and your plants grow bigger. The nutrients in that fertilizer end up in the biomass of the plant and they're not moving further downstream. So at least temporarily, plant uptake can remove nitrogen and phosphorus. But this is where things start to become, uh, for a biogeochemist, interesting. So when nitrogen enters a system, there are microbes in the soil that conduct a process called denitrification that basically changes that nitrogen into a gas. So that nitrogen then leaves the system. Once it's a gas, it's in the atmosphere, it's not gonna flow downstream into a place like the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Phosphorus, on the other hand, doesn't have a major gas form. All phosphorus can do is it can stick to the soil. Uh, if it's already stuck to a particle, it can just settle in that wetland and be buried. And wetlands are a really good place for slowing down water um, and burying some of that heavy phosphorus particulate matter, but the phosphorus doesn't really go away. It just builds up in the soil of that wetland. That is the main way that wetlands remove phosphorus, right? So you're starting to see some important differences and it's important to know that different uh, conditions promote these two different kinds of processes. So you could imagine a single wetland or a single place in a single wetland not being great at doing both of these things at one time, although our goal is to remove both at the same time. So now that we have this in our mind, you know the basic biogeochemistry of nutrients and wetlands, it's important to step back and think about all of the monitoring programs, the really well-established, well-developed monitoring programs for wetlands that are in use in America and in Ohio. Their main goal is to establish ecosystem health or to monitor the, uh, the habitat provisioning of wetlands. And to do that, they measure things related to obvious visible features like plant biodiversity or size, right? At a basic level, delineating wetland acreage following the three main criteria that the Army Corps of Engineers lay out of, you know, hydric soils, wetland vegetation, and wetland hydrology um, uh, is used as criteria for wetland success or wetland evaluation. Based on those structural features, the assumption is that these nitrogen and phosphorus removing processes are occurring, but they're in many ways invisible to these more traditional structural indicator-based monitoring system. This is 
totally appropriate for assessing ecosystem health for just knowing how many acres of wetlands there are on the landscape. But when there's a considerable investment being made in ecosystems specifically to address nitrogen and phosphorus with such critical issues at stake, like our state's water quality, you could argue that this kind of structural based monitoring program isn't going to be good enough to demonstrate the return on this investment. And so that's why the core goal, everything that's defining our, our main compass point in this project is we want to directly assess the wetland nitrogen and phosphor removal of the wetland projects of each individual project as best we can implemented through this program. So we're essentially making these formerly invisible nitrogen and phosphorus cycling processes visible by directly measuring them. So how do we do that? Um, to know whether or not, just if a wetland removes nutrients, um, we take an approach that's sort of like balancing your bank account. So we call it mass balance, mass balance or nutrient accounting. We calculate a nutrient budget, right? We try to measure and account for all of the nutrients that are entering the wetland and all of the nutrients that are leaving the wetland. And you hope, just like you hope in your bank account, that there's less leaving than going in, right? So that would be a success. Uh, this is really helpful because it gives us an actual number, like pounds of phosphorus removed per acre per year. And that way we can then uh, do cost benefit analyses. If we know what the financial or capital investment in a particular wetland ecosystem has been, we can relate that to the actual amount of nutrients that that wetland removed. And um, it's a, it lets us directly compare this to other best management practices and other interventions based on a really policy relevant outcome, right? For example, the 40% phosphorus load reduction target for the Western Basin of Lake Erie. This gives us a number that lets us align it right with that. But the caveat is there are some wetlands where this is not possible because they don't have really easily monitored inflows and outflows. It's also incredibly time consuming to do this uh, right, to get the estimate to the point of a certainty level that's useful. And also it doesn't tell us much about what's happening inside the wetland. So our program also incorporates measures that will help us refine our understanding of the processes happening inside different kinds of wetlands. What's the wetland actually doing to remove the nutrients? Which of those processes are dominating. Um, this helps us support mechanistic modeling, which can help us use lesson learned from one intensively monitored wetland um, to inform our understanding of less intensively monitored wetlands. Um, and it can also help then inform wetland design and management. If we know how a wetland is working, maybe there are certain levers we can pull or things we can tweak about wetland design and implementation to maximize nutrient removal. So uh, the data collection that we decided to put in place uh, for our monitoring program tries to get at all of these things. And I know there's a lot of um, individuals on the call who are interested in exactly what we're going to be measuring and how that's gonna align with the question. So I'm gonna give a brief overview here um, and I'll add that there's a lot more detail in the monitoring plan document that was shared. So first of all, um, hydrology, the way wetland move, the way water moves through a wetland and how much water is in a wetland is by and large the overlying factor determining the wetland structure and the wetland function. If you don't know the hydrology, you don't know the wetland. So our main goal with hydrologic monitoring is to estimate a water balance, create a budget, just like I mentioned earlier with nutrients, to support that nutrient budgeting. We have to know how much water is going in and out and how much nutrients are in that water to calculate those inflows and outflows. And also to monitor the conditions within the wetland, right? So if you think about a spot in a wetland, at one point in the year, it might be flooded. At another point in the year, it might be drained and maybe completely dry. What's happening in the soil under those two different conditions can be completely different. So those are the two things that we're um, aiming to do with measuring hydrology. We're combining um, sensor systems. We're gonna put sensors in the water and in other parts of the wetland that will measure water level and soil moisture and flow rates for us continuously, along with boots on the ground, manual measurements of depths and flow rate and groundwater exchange. In select projects, the combination of those measurements is gonna support detailed three-dimensional hydrologic models modeling, which is going to also inform our understanding of some of these systems in a really detailed way. 
Um, a lot of action also happens in soils and sediments. You know, might have noticed earlier the two big arrows, denitrification and phosphorosorption and burial. Both of those are soil and sediment based processes. So a major goal for us is to assess how much nutrients are stored in the sediments and soils. What's the chance that sediments and soils are exchanging nutrients with surface water, right? Are they actually releasing nutrients instead of storing the nutrients? And are they transforming the nutrients? Are they changing the nitrogen and phosphorus that are coming in from one chemical form to another? Which can have really important implications for whether or not algae are gonna like those nutrients and grow when they encounter them. So to assess the soil processes, we're gonna combine detailed soil mapping using available soil maps and also newly collected geophysical measurements that give us a window into the invisible structures and chemistry of the soil with discrete on the ground actual sampling of soil and sediment to measure the characteristics of the soil, the amount of nutrients that are stored in the soil and whether or not those nutrients are gonna exchange with the water. Of course, with monitoring programs like this, water quality is often what first comes to mind and it's often where we start. It's critically important, right? Our goal here is to measure not only the amount of nutrients in the water entering a wetland, in the water leaving a wetland, and in the water within the wetland, in the body of the wetland, in pools or other portions of the wetland, um, and also the chemical forms of those nutrients to be able to do that budgeting. It, are there more or less nutrients coming in or out? And are those nutrients staying in the same form or are they being transformed into different chemical forms? Again, we're gonna combine continuously logging sensors with discrete, on the ground samples of water that we're gonna directly measure the nutrient chemistry in. And then finally, I mentioned earlier that plants can be really powerful forces of nutrient uptake and at least temporary storage. So to assess that component of the nutrient budget in our wetlands, we want to estimate how much nutrients are taken up and temporarily stored in the biomass. We're combining drone photography, so aerial imagery that give us a big map of the wetland and we can use um, colors and different forms of the imagery to detect patches of vegetation. And we can then on the ground, ground truth, identify the actual species, the dominant species that make up those different patches to create a map of the dominant kinds of vegetation, basically what, what's mostly growing there, right? In wetlands, it's often, there's a bunch of cattail there because it's deeper and there's a bunch of Phragmites there, right? Um, and then to, to, to go along with that, we're actually gonna take pieces of leaves and pieces of stems and pieces of roots we're gonna grind them up and actually measure how much nitrogen and phosphorus are in those different parts of different kinds of plants. So eventually we can do a little bit of math and calculate how much phosphorus is in all the cattail stems in a wetland um, and fill out what's, what's referred to as that storage pool, that storage component of a wetland. For all of these measures, right, it's important to keep in mind that there's a lot of variability in weather and conditions from year to year. Each one of us can think back to summers and winters past and how some are hotter, some are colder, some are wetter, some are drier. This year to year variability, along with the fact that each wetland system itself will change, right? Especially when you're starting from a system that looks like this post restoration, um, uh, wetland ecosystems develop. Many of us probably learned about ecological succession in um, early science classes, right? It takes, because of these year to year variability and the fact that ecosystems naturally develop, they're not static, especially when they're brand new ecosystems like this, it takes multiple years of monitoring to answer the questions that we have, to evaluate ecosystem function and predict an ecosystem's trajectory. No one year or no one month is going to answer the questions that the state of Ohio has about these wetlands. So that's an important component of our project. Now you might be remembering all of these dots on the map and thinking that is a lot of wetlands. I could imagine a single master's student doing an entire thesis on one of those four components in any one of those dots, and that is true. That is why A, we have a lot of people, and B, we've developed what I think is a pretty nifty tiered approach to realistically address these questions. Um, and as part of this tiered approach, we intend to monitor all of the projects in a very distributed way for indicators and 
red flags for things like nutrient release. And then we've identified selective projects that are representative of key kinds of systems to um, intensively monitor and study, to take a lot of samples, deploy a lot of sensors, do some of the more time consuming experimental work that really will tell us what the soils are doing, what the plants are doing. This is both gonna help us understand what's going on in the wetlands and make assumptions uh, about the less intensively sampled wetlands based on the intensively sampled ones. And it's also gonna guide our future sampling effort. It's gonna help us know how many water samples do we need to take to really understand a humongous wetland with all of these different kinds of areas within it. Again, you're probably thinking this is a lot of work. This is a lot of stuff and you would be right. So how are we going to manage all of this? Um, we've structured the program. This is one of the other benefits of the LEARN network and having so much uh, scientific expertise in this space. So to monitor the projects themselves, we've established uh, the what we call base field crews at five of the contributing universities led by the principal investigators you see here. Um, these field crews will coordinate the research at specific projects that are assigned by geography. Um, they will be responsible for implementing basic sampling and sensor maintenance, conduct and conducting routine sample analyses in their labs following standardized protocols. We also have a set of what we call expert field crews that have expertise in specific applications that aren't as generally available to all of the universities. These crews conduct specific tasks related to that expertise and they communicate and coordinate with the base field crews. So these crews are the soil geophysics crew led by Kennedy Doro, the drone imagery crew led by Ricky Becker, the plant sampling and identification crew led by Kevin McClooney and Helen Michaels, and the hydrologic monitoring and modeling crew led by Gan Ming Liu. Okay, we, well, okay, there we go. We also have uh, reached out to some other entities with specific technical expertise. We're working with the consulting firm Limnotech to design a low cost wirelessly connected sensor system. So rather than purchasing single one-off sensors for individual products, we're really trying to take as much of an integrated systems approach as we can um, to have standardized protocols and standardized sensors used for different um, applications. And we're working with Ohio State's University Translational Data Analytics Institute to build a database for all of our data and to help us design some data management and sharing tools. So this obviously takes a lot of coordination. So the people that you see here are doing our best to communicate with one another between Learn and Sea Grant and the ODNR and with all of those different individuals to coordinate the work that goes on um, and also coordinate communication with the conservation partners and with complementary research, uh, uh, research activities done aside from this monitoring program. Uh, I mentioned some complementary research, right? So we're viewing this program as a foundation that can be built upon for more detailed mechanistic research or for complementary efforts uh, that may not address this core scope issue of nutrient removal, but are just as relevant as we try to make decisions about how to implement and manage wetlands in Ohio. Um, and there are going to be a lot of opportunities to engage educate and participate, um, even for non-researchers, non-university affiliates. We're hoping to implement some participatory or citizen science programs as a part of this. And frankly, at a certain point, we are gonna really rely on those volunteer science data collection efforts to really um, achieve the, the spatial resolution, the quantity of data that's gonna be helpful. So just a couple examples of some of the coordinated research efforts. So um, Gabby Kenny is a PhD student from Rice University. He's an anthropologist and he's been um, 
contributing to our project and studying our project for his dissertation, which is studying how um, big picture uh, science policy and environmental policy decisions play out in on the ground actions based on scientific research. Um, we're also talking with Lauren Nose and people from Craig Williamson's group at Miami University to investigate how the role that dissolved organic carbon is playing in nutrient removal in these wetlands. Um, there's going to be a ton, I can imagine dozens of student research projects that may have already begun throughout our many sites and throughout the state that's going to complement the core work done by the program. And I mentioned earlier, um, some participatory science programs are in development. Stay tuned. We have a lot of ideas, but we haven't quite gotten them off the ground yet. All right. So um, a lot of people, uh, the way that we make sure this is integrative and flexible and transparent is through frequent meetings and communication among all of the personnel that I listed. Um, we will have an annual workshop every year to review our data and update the monitoring program. The monitoring plan, the framework that we've set out, the specific protocols we've set out, um, we're gonna balance standardized data collection for the longevity of the project with flexibility to adapt our program as we see opportunities for improvement and as needs change. So that's baked into the system, this adaptive framework. Um, and then finally, a really, really important part that I can't stress enough is ensuring that we manage our data appropriately so that it's of high quality and we can share it more broadly. Um, and to tell you a little bit about the vast amount of complicated work that's going into that process. Um, I want to introduce Haisa Mendonca, who's our project coordinator and chief data manager on the project. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, this is a very brief overview. Um, but for the past year, the monitoring program has been um, developing a robust and centralized um, data and quality management system. So the goal here is to ensure that all the steps uh, of data handling are well documented for the sake of quality, transparency, and accountability, um, but also to enable the program to be a model for open data and open science. Um, we are using a diverse set of tools, um, as you can see, continuously revising um, our protocols and standard operating procedures, um, working in collaboration with Ohio State's Department of Computer Science and Engineering um, and Translational Translational Data Analytics Institute, like Lauren mentioned. Um, we're following best practices from well-established long-term monitoring programs as well, um, like the National Asterine Research Reserve System, um, NEON, and also the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. Um, so far, we've been making extensive use of quality assurance criteria during our data collection. We're using version control and continuous integration for quality control and data processing. We're custom building an open source database, and we plan to release um, versions of our data in various formats to be readily available to our stakeholders and researchers, just as a way to ensure our findings are, are shared broadly. But that's that's our a little a little snippet of what's going on behind the scenes here. But I'll hand it back over to you, Malin. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Aisa. Yeah, I'm very excited about this bespoke database and data management structure that um, we're working really hard to build. So I wanted to just summarize some of the accomplishments that we've made as a program in a relatively short period of time. I mentioned earlier, we formed this program, I think June 2020 is when we could point as the birth date of our program. Um, we spent that time just deciding whether or not this was a doable task. And then we spent fall and winter of 2020, 2021, discussing our framework for implementing a monitoring plan like this. We wrote a draft of that framework as a report that was reviewed by about 30 technical and management experts, both in the state of Ohio and throughout the country. They provided really useful uh, feedback and critique that led to an edited and updated final version of what we'll call the 2021 monitoring plan. Um, it will be updated annually. So this 2021 version was finalized and approved by the ODNR this spring. So that means that this summer we've been building this monitoring program to get it off the ground. And that involved 
hiring and training technical staff for each one of those uh, field crews that I mentioned and for some of the other technical expertise. At this point, we have hired um, at least 33 full-time technical staff and student researchers. Um, we've also been purchasing sensors and equipment to help us um, collect data. We've been developing protocols with a lot of uh, special attention paid to ensuring that our samples are collected in standardized ways and we're tracking those samples and not losing any of the important information about the soil and water samples that we're collecting. And we've started actually collecting data. We've collected a fair bit of data already. So of the 59 projects that you saw on that map that are currently under contract with the ODNR, probably about 15 to 16 of them have actually had construction completed. Many of them are still just in design phases. They're just a map on a piece of paper. And so those we haven't started monitoring yet. But we have made, um, since the beginning of the project, 80, at least 81 research visits. So one researcher and one or another of our crew has stepped on the ground um, at one of these project sites 81 times to 16 of those 59 project sites. We've collected over 300 soil and water samples that are currently in the queue for chemical analyses. Um, and we've collected a lot of drone imagery, soil geophysics and vegetation surveys to characterize um, particularly the sites that we intend to monitor intensively. So it's a lot. I'm pretty proud of what we've done <laughs> in a year and a half. Um, looking forward, uh, our first uh, workshop where we'll update our annual monitoring plan and write routine monitoring plans for the projects where construction has been completed is coming up in January. Um, we're all really looking forward to finally having some face-to-face -face time with whiteboards to um, tackle some of the remaining challenges and reflect on the data that we've already collected. And then next summer, summer 2022, is going to be the first year where we're collecting actual what we call routine monitoring data. The data that's going to be that time point one in the five to ten years or or hopefully more of data collection at these wetland projects to really address the challenging questions that have been posed. Okay, so we're scientists, right? So when we look at these big questions that the DNR posed to us, is wetland restoration a cost-effective method for mitigating nutrient loads to water bodies? And how do we effectively manage wetland restoration into the future? These are big questions. We can break them down into some smaller, but still very big questions that frankly are not just priorities within the state of Ohio, but these are wide knowledge and understanding gaps in wetland and environmental science throughout the country and in the world. So first of all, we want to know we know we know that no one intervention is going to completely solve the wicked problem of harmful algal blooms and eutrophication. So but what's a large unknown is how effective are wetlands actually compared to these other techniques. So we're hoping that our data can help compare how the role that wetlands do and can play in addressing these problems. Of course, no decision about wetlands are made solely for nutrient removal. Wetlands are valued in part because of the wide array of ecosystem services they can provide. So we're also hoping to develop complementary research efforts that are funded from other sources to identify what co-benefits these restored wetlands might provide. And are there disservices that need to be considered like greenhouse gas releases? Um, we should be able to address which wetland designs, restoration activities, and management strategies are most effective at cultivating nutrient removal and maybe maximize co-benefits as well. Um, and then finally, a really important question at the state level that um, our state agency partners grapple with a lot is where should these, where should we prioritize placing wetlands as infrastructure? Where in the wetland, where in the watershed should wetlands go to maximize effectiveness? Should a single wetland at the outflow of a large watershed be implemented? Lots of small wetlands throughout the tributaries of the wetland. And what role do wetlands that are, don't have any obvious connection to surface water flows play in reducing nutrients. Ohio is actually really uniquely poised to address this question, especially because of the National Center for Water Quality Research and other efforts to monitor nutrient loads at watershed outlets. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is not just an issue in Ohio. The understanding the role that wetlands can play in solving global eutrophication problems is 
a massively like widely recognized knowledge gap in the field of biogeochemistry and the field of wetland science. And the H2 Ohio program, me and the rest of my team, sorry, my slides are being very, un yeah, there you go. Um, I'm really excited. I feel really fortunate to be part of a program that's uniquely poised to fill this massive gap. I and none of the technical experts that we consulted with are aware of any other program that monitors so many different kinds of wetlands um, at the same time under the same umbrella for nutrient removal. So this is truly a unique opportunity, not just to ensure that the investment of the H2 Ohio initiative makes good on its promise, but also it fills um, a really important knowledge gap globally. And with that, I would be happy to take questions. I'll pass it over to Chris to moderate the question and answer portion of the event. Thanks both Janice and, and Lauren, that was fantastic. So I do have um, some questions that were already submitted with the registration. So I'll plug my way through some of those as I look for hands to be raised and for uh, questions to come up in the chat. And some of these, it's great, uh, Lauren uh, and Janice, you were able to answer these as they came up, but uh, some of them are a little nuanced. So uh, coming back to Lauren knows at Miami University, you had mentioned uh, Miami University and Lauren, is Ohio comparing natural to constructed wetlands for their performance um, to reduce nutrients? Absolutely, that's a really excellent question. Right now within our scope, we are not comparing natural wetlands to restored wetlands. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, the policy goal here is to remove nutrients right? It's not to um, solely create a system that uh, recreates some kind of past condition. Um, and so we think that that's an important thing to keep in mind as a co-benefit. And uh, we value sort of creating wetlands that are comparable to or, or have sort of features of natural system health. But the more direct policy relevant question is how, mu how much nutrients do they, do they stop? And then the other reason is the reference wetlands in the state of Ohio are pretty um, hard to come by. Lauren, thank you for that. Um, coming to the next one, uh, have wet prairies been implemented for algal nutrient capture? So the, the question again uh, is coming from John Blakeman at Meadow Environmentalists. It says wet prairies have a phenomenal nutrient capture rates, but are much less expensive to install and maintain. So in our in our conversations here, can you talk about uh, prairie, prairie wetlands? Yeah, I think um, um, it's not our intentions to, to specifically focus in those as, as, a, as a management practice, but uh, one of the things I probably skip, skimmed over in, in my description of the examples uh, is that each of these restoration sites are highly complex and components of those restorations will likely include habitat like that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a, some, I don't know if Oakwood or some of the other ones in Northern Ohio will definitely include portions that will emulate those features. Um, but as of right now, it's not a management focus, but it's is good to hear your feedback about that. Thank you. And John, I know you had your hand raised earlier in the process. Is that the question you wanted or did you need something else, sir? And if you want to unmute, go for it. That was fine. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll, I'll set. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great. Um, next one that we have here, um, and we've touched on this a little bit, but Laura Manns from the Ohio Wetland Association in the future, will efforts be made to quantify other, quantify other economic values of wetlands besides the nutrient reduction? Can you build on that a little bit too? Yeah, so that is uh, what I mentioned earlier about the complementary research efforts. So the, the scope of the problem that this project is focused on is strictly nutrient removal. So that's a pretty big bite to chew off, um, even with the, um, the support that we've gotten from the ODNR is letting us build a really robust network. But we 
cannot support the direct measure of co-benefits aside from nutrient removal. And that's why we're actively trying to coordinate with collaborating researchers to help them identify funding sources, or if they've already received grants that are relevant, try to align their sampling and their research so that we do create a foundation for those data to be collected because we recognize that decisions need to be made in a holistic way and not about any single economic benefit or ecosystem service. And I'll just give a plug for that. Reach out to anybody on this call. If you're with Audubon Society and you have an idea or a thought about you know, going in and doing bird work, great. I know that there's a recent award from the International Joint Commissions that went to Limnotech um, and the Cleveland Water Alliance to do a community science project. So I will be chatting with them as I'm a member of the IJC on, on can some of those community science efforts you know, be layered here. So please don't hesitate to reach out to the team that's on this webinar now and, and see if there's a, there's a role Coming to Teresa Dirksen uh, with Mercer County, how long will it take to see results once monitoring of a system begins? Will there be real-time data um, to affect uh, site management decisions? So two questions, how, how quickly do we anticipate uh, the monitoring or the results to come in and, and, and can um, that data be available to change some, some management? That's a really excellent question. So we are hoping to at least be able to see trends after about five years, but um, most ecosystem ecologists would not feel comfortable making a determination about the effectiveness until at least 10 years out. So um, like I said, we'll be looking for things like red flags. There's certain things like if we see a uh, water sample at the outflow of a wetland where the phosphorus concentration is much higher than the water sample at the inflow, we'll take special note of that. If we identify management interventions that have really obvious science-based, credible um, opportunities to improve the functioning of the wetland, we will point that out. But we don't anticipate to have any sort of conclusive assessments of the effectiveness of any individual project um, for multiple years. I just want to thank Bob for putting in the Oakwoods and St. Joe's sites that have some wet meadows in there. And then also Emily Kuzmik, uh, mentioned that there might be a possibility to do some bird studies. Um, so thanks, em Emily, for that. We will follow up on that um, later. Um, Craig Williams from Miami University asked, and you touched on it, I believe, a little bit, Lauren, this, this uh, dissolved organic matter component. So it's a fundamental ecosystem regulator of lake ecosystems, you know, can influence light and food webs and things like that. So curious on what the H2O Health program is doing to monitor uh, this dissolved organic matter, or DOM. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good question. And I'm actually really excited that we've started having conversations with your lab group because we made a long list of all of the things that we might want to measure. Uh, and DOC was definitely on that list along with a lot of other components like major cations and anions that can help us with water tracing. We're sort of viewing those measurements as opportunistic and if they fit in with the main researchers program because of the large nature of this project, we had to really focus in on things that we could draw a direct line between to nutrient budgeting um, with some supportive measures that support understanding of mechanisms. And so we're really grateful for the opportunity to partner with other researchers to help beef up our measurements of other things like DOM. Just to piggyback off that, Lauren, the team that you saw here is, is, a, is a great team. It's been phenomenal to work with these folks. But with this being an adaptive management approach, we are going to have to add other folks going forward. And so please come to us with ideas um, and, and we'd love to engage in that dialogue. I will also add that um, the Ohio Department of Higher Education's Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative has been funding projects to look at wetland type monitoring and, and creative technology to get in there because we need to get into the, in the ground right now to, to do what we know how to do. Um, and that's not what our budget is funding is these extra cool opportunities and ideas, but we are trying to leverage funds to make sure that that, that happens, that we're bringing in cool new technologies. Uh, there's a question in here that says, um, for projects where data collection wasn't able to commence prior to construction, um, has the research team given any thoughts on how to benchmark improvements in the absence of this baseline? That comes from Mark Dilley with Mad Scientist Associates. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so understanding the difference between how a wetland or how a, a site or a patch of land, right? Because many of these patches of lands have not been wetlands for hundreds of years or maybe never were a wetland 
in the case of constructive wellings. Comparing sort of pre-post is one way to assess, but we're not necessarily interested just in improvement. We're interested in the actual amount of nutrients removed. So we are gonna do our best to um, learn about the history of each site and be able to contextualize the nutrient removal function of each site um, by making some assumptions based on that history. But it's a very project by project approach in terms of how we incorporate um, whether actual on the ground pre construction monitoring, which in some cases is valuable and in some cases is not, um, and actual sort of thinking about the trajectory of the system prior from prior to restoration through restoration and beyond. We're still you, working on the formalization of those different processes. So, cause they're so diverse. That's great. Uh, Christina Durkis from our shop, Sea Grant posted that last harmful algal bloom research initiative report. So thanks for that, Christina. And then Hannah, I see your, your queen. Uh, will the database, the data management system being developed by OSU be available for use to other partners monitoring Ohio or H2 Ohio wetlands? I, you know, we hadn't thought about that, but I think so. I think that the intention is to design a database that facilitates data sharing within our group now and then facilitates data sharing broadly with the public once the data we've collected meets some basic assurance standards. We're not only going to release products that where everything's been summarized and in a brochure. We're going to release the actual raw data once we're confident that the numbers are accurate. Um, and so I don't see why we wouldn't include data that's been collected at the projects by people outside of the program. Um, we would probably treat you as an affiliate if you're collecting samples at the same project, because we want all the information that we can gather um, about each of these projects. So that's a that's a really good conversation for us to, to have, I think. Yeah, and, and, and just to say, um, that's great, Lauren, thanks for that. But this, the way we're uploading data into the system and tracking things is pretty intense. And so when a sample gets collected, the way it gets swiped as a QR code and, and gets loaded into a database and tracked, and there's a handholding process that occurs, um, if we were going to allow that to happen, we got to make sure that that person is trained on how to properly collect the data, how to properly upload it, and what that QA, QC process will be looking like. But ultimately, for me, and I think a lot of the team members, it would be great that any wetland that is built in the state of Ohio or the Great Lakes region, whether it's H2O funded or not, follows this handbook because it allows us then in the future to compare apples to apples that we can look at the efficiency of a wetland that wasn't perhaps funded by h2o ohio with one that that is and so i do think this has to be something where i'm going to encourage it to be something that everybody utilizes going into the future there is a question from luke robertson um coming to us from georgia actually georgia sea grant and, and, and georgia cooperative extension he's interested in how we might measure bacteria in the system. Can you touch on that, Lauren, a little bit, please? We are not. We don't have plans to measure bacteria right now, but that'd be another opportunity if, if a case were to be made that measuring the bacteria would directly inform the nutrient budgeting, we would add it in to our measurements. Um, if it's not, but it seems like an important um, mechanistic piece to understand, we would be really excited about collaborating with researchers to develop a complementary and, and coordinated program. And I think Janice wanted to say something in response to the last question. You're good? Yeah, and it was relatively minor because I was looking at Hannah's question in terms, and I interpret it differently, but I really liked Haiza's uh, slide where she talked about uh, the last, um, the guide diagram one, and it shows that we're going to probably at the end of this have two kind of data product outputs that will go out to either researchers or to the general public, and that will include um, both like a data dashboard uh, which is something that will be really easy for teachers and students and uh, decision makers to look at and get some general information in that those dashboards will likely include um, both real-time data where it's possible, so things about probably related to like weather where it's really easy for us to provide that in real time, but some of like the nutrient processing and some of the more complex um, data that needs to go through a more thorough uh, QAQC process will, will be given out in summary form. Uh, but then much of that raw data will also have some sort of format uh, to also provide to, to researchers and be fully transparent for uh, again, emphasizing that desire to have this be 
um, a foundational program, a foundational monitoring program where additional research can be, um, answers can be answered, uh, questions be answered um, by anybody who might want to, to take a look at them. That's great. And Bob Midden followed up on those saying there's some scientists, including a group here at BGSU, are interested in characterizing the microbiome and wetlands and exploring the relationship to organic carbon and nutrient dynamics. So I'm sure that eventually we will be able to have some ancillary projects investigating those issues. And so um, for, for you, Luke, reach out to Ohio Sea Grant too. This might be one of those cross sea grant programs where we use our grant funding to fund one of these initiatives. So that would be that would be great. Um, Jessica Wall, uh, Wahlberger from Lucas Soil and Water basically just wanted to know the same thing. Where will data be available and where, when and where? So soon to be determined, it'll likely be linked through that Learn website, but we will keep folks posted. Um, Larry Antosh, just for the Farm Bureau, and this is one of the, I think this will be our last question, but it's an important one. Uh, Larry's curious about what are the long-term O&M needs, so the operation and management needs. And so that might be a question for Janice, um, but that is that is something that we need to think about. Yeah, no, that is something that is highly discussed among all of the ODNR managers is, um, you know, for, for, for me and Lauren, figuring out a way that we can monitor it to inform those management needs, but then also within the ODNR, how do we help uh, support those actions that need to occur on the landscape? So um, I don't have a, a specific answer for you, but maybe Lauren does. I, I just want to add that many of the projects are going to be managed, right? Um, they're gonna to have to be managed, right? Every ecosystem, somebody's gonna be out there looking at the plants. Many of them have things like water level control structures where a manager may directly decide that a site needs to be flooded or drained. Um, and so one of the challenging but really exciting parts of this program is we're trying to also develop a way to monitor the management, right? management is already going to be happening. And some of those human behaviors can have a superseding effect on the nutrient removal of a wetland. For example, if the wetland outlet has a water level control structure and a manager decides to open that control structure and release water from the wetland into a tributary, into a downstream system, right? All of a sudden, any nutrient that's in that water will be exported from the system. So regardless of any of the natural processes that I explained to you, that one decision might switch the net, might switch the balance, right? And so we're looking for ways. That's actually one of the more complicated components of this monitoring is monitoring the human decisions so that later on we can inform decisions into the future and maybe help inform some kind of a management toolkit or management guidance for different kinds of systems. And managing for different co-benefits is a really important part of that conversation. So last two things, because we're two minutes over. So I just want to make sure when, when, when Lauren, you had mentioned this idea of other partnerships and what this wetland monitoring might provide, one of those is siting of future wetlands. And I just want to make sure that folks know that we've been in conversation with a lot of folks in that space, with TNC, with the Black Swamp Conservancy. So those decisions are, 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 are or those conversations are happening. And just to maybe take us out on a high note, one of the questions we got, and it was more of a kind of a statement, came from Carrie Baker at Northridge High School. She says, I teach environmental science course. A lot of the focus is on water resources in the state water resource protection, it says our school has several catchment areas for parking lot runoff and this, and she would like to learn about ways that her students could monitor wetlands on their property in their backyard. So just a really cool thing perhaps to carry us out. But again, I wanna thank the governor and the H2 Ohio project. I wanna thank the DNR and this just phenomenal group of, of academic institutions. I think this is great. And so that's all I have for parting words. I don't know if Janice or Lauren had anything else to add. No, I just want to say thanks. And um, educators who mentioned that, we're keeping you on our list so that when we have opportunities, we're going to reach out to you because we're really jazzed about that. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.